Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Oak, for inviting me to speak. Um, two or three years ago, a friend and I began jokingly, very, very jokingly, to start just starting to talk about a liberal arts college here in Utah. We met earlier while we were actually teaching at a liberal arts college here, but sadly that one had to close due to some problems in its earlier days. At its closing, that's when we started really discussing the different ideas about a liberal arts college, but each time we would start to talk about it, we would come back to reality and wait for somebody else to do it. Every couple of months, we would talk about it some more and still wait. Then we would plan a bit and brainstorm about it and continue to wait. I, I, that probably doesn't sound familiar to any of you. Soon it became apparent that no one was going to be starting a classical liberal arts college in Utah anytime soon, including us. But why classical liberal arts? Why not just teach at a regular university? My journey into a classical liberal arts education began when my first child started to get to closer to the age of going to school, and I really felt like I needed to homeschool him. So I have spent the last 25 years homeschooling my children all the way through high school. My five children and I just naturally drifted toward classics and the great books, and we all worked hard to get our education. I received my master's and my PhD during our homeschool years, and my children received their education right along with me. We read, we learned, we discussed, and we discovered great principles together. My youngest just left to serve a mission for our church this past July, and so at the end of May, we both graduated from our homeschool together. Aristotle said in his Nicomachean Ethics, and I'm paraphrasing here, that wisdom is knowledge of the highest things. Aquinas called wisdom the accumulation of knowledge of things that never change. Instead, in education today, we are inundated with all types of things at the touch of a button. All sorts of information is available to us. But for the most part, this consists of current events, the latest education fads, entertainment, and technology. All of these are things that are changing constantly. This cannot be the knowledge to which Aristotle and Aquinas were referring. But these were the principles and the truths which I wanted for my family. That's what a classical liberal arts education is all about. So what kinds of things then never change and make up what these men called wisdom? In past times, such as at our nation's founding, education was seen as a means to cultivate the conscience, to train the intellect, and discipline the baser animal instincts we all have, while at the same time to strengthen the higher and the divine which is equally inherent in each one of us. In other words, education was seen in a large part as teaching a man to become virtuous. And it's the traditional definition of virtue that I'm referring to here, which would include honesty, integrity, courage, patience, and all the other types of virtues that make up character. A classical liberal arts education trains students to consider all ideas, unafraid of challenges or debate, because the conversation is never about who is right, but rather focuses on what is right, finding the truth and discarding the rest. Human nature is a big part of this. A liberal arts education sees the patterns of human nature through history and assists us to understand and recognize the cause and effect of natural law. We can see for ourselves the wisdom and folly of ideas regardless of their public prevalence or popularity. It is a study of ideas and their consequences. And let me just add that job training is not what they were talking about. 
But my colleague and I just kept waiting, hoping that someone else would step up and start that classical liberal arts college. My youngest and I even flew out to Michigan to visit Hillsdale because he really, really wanted that classical liberal arts education. The problem is the cost is kind of prohibitive and there are very few members of our particular church there, so dating and marrying makes it kind of hard. But as my children have begun to attend colleges here in Utah, they have discussed with me some of the things that they have been taught instead of true principles, kind of what Oak was referring to. Some of these include such things as, Europe never had a slavery problem, only the United States. True, that is true. I mean, not true, but that's what's being taught. Um, also, how we should worship the false goddess Asherah of the Old Testament, because she's really our Heavenly Mother. Or how about they were told they should transfer to the University of Utah and major in queer studies, because we need more of those majors. These are, I, these are totally legit. My kids have been taught these. And a lot of other things as well. And it was upon hearing these and all these other similar stories that I'm not even going to mention that Mount Liberty College was born. And we're hoping to open for classes this next fall. There is so much postmodernist propaganda being disseminated at every university, including those here in Utah. Sometimes we like to believe that we're a bit sheltered from all of that here. But when it comes to education, we're not. And here is one more piece of propaganda we all hear all the time. Work really hard, get a great education so you can get a really great job, then you'll make lots of money and you'll be happy. Have you ever heard that before? I, I know you've all heard it before. But in reality, it's just as wrong as all the other examples. As we have worked to start Mount Liberty College, one piece of wisdom which my colleagues and I have studied is happiness. And by happiness, I mean joy or fulfillment, not happiness as in pleasure or fun. So imagine this line as a continuum between the high points and low points in our lives. Many would put happiness or joy on one side and sadness or pain on the other. We work all our lives to get to the happiness side and as far away from the sadness side as possible. The basic formula for this is what I told you before. Get a good education so you can get a really great job, so you can make lots of money, and then you'll be happy. And there are other things on this continuum as well, like personal hygiene, diet, health, environment, living conditions, exercise, and even sleep. We are on this continuum when we think of such things as eating, sleeping, working, and even earning money. It's basically a continuum of pain avoidance. So if you think about it, I eat so that I don't feel the pain of hunger. I sleep so I don't feel the pain of fatigue. I earn money so I don't feel the pain of poverty. I shower so I don't feel the pain of filth. I brush my teeth so I don't feel the pain of cavities. But having no toothache and being clean doesn't necessarily make me happy. It just means that I'm not in pain, I'm not sad, I'm not filthy. This continuum is really about pain avoidance rather than happiness. We just don't recognize that. These things cannot make us happy, and yet we are constantly told by everyone, school, work, social media, ads, basically everything in the world, that we can be happy on this continuum if we can get far away from the sad side as we possibly can. But not sad is not the equivalent to being happy. The trouble is, is that we work our entire lives getting far away from sadness and pain and never feel happy. It makes us feel cheated. We then get cynical and basically give up on those dreams. We start to believe that all the things we are told are wrong. What we're missing is this higher continuum, 
the metaphysical or the spiritual continuum. This is where real happiness is achieved. What do we work on in this continuum? A sense of purpose, finding our path, faith, liberty to act, service, creativity, charity, progress in our own personal lives. We can feel pain, which is way over on the bottom, on the left of the bottom continuum, and yet still feel happiness way over on the top right continuum at the exact same time. Any mother here who has children would know what I'm talking about for sure. But that's how we know that there are two continuums rather than just one. But without this knowledge of how to truly be happy, people follow the steps they're taught and realize they're still not happy. Soon they just give up, often lose their faith, figure the system is rigged, and start turning to alternative measures to find happiness. The trouble is they remain on the wrong continuum, never finding that happiness they are struggling to grasp. This is part of what education is missing today. What we don't realize is what researchers found in studying people like Viktor Frankl. What sets humans apart from animals is not the pursuit of happiness, which occurs all across the natural world, but the pursuit of meaning, which is unique to humans. Finding that happiness is what brings, or finding, excuse me, finding that meaning is what brings real happiness. True happiness or joy then comes not from pursuing happiness or merely avoiding pain, but finding what gives life meaning and doing the work it takes to get there. The motto of Mount Liberty College is without virtue there can be no liberty. This comes from a paper one of our founders, Benjamin Rush, wrote in 1806 on the proper education of a republic. The entire paragraph reads, the only foundation for a useful education in a republic is to be laid in religion. Without this, there can be no virtue, and, now, and without virtue, there can be no liberty. And liberty is the object and life of all Republican governments. So we at Mount Liberty College will be preparing our students to enter the world, defending liberty, standing in humility, and upholding virtue. Today, 60% of students lose their faith by the time they finish college at a regular university. 60%. 40% lose their faith by the time they finish college at a religious university. 40%. We have separated our faith from education so much that many students leave college no longer believing in God. We want students to keep their faith and virtue, which the founders understood was necessary to maintain freedom. Of course, ultimately, the true wisdom they learn from a classical liberal arts education will help them in all aspects of their lives, including faith. And yes, that also includes getting a job. One historian, called the relationship between virtue, faith, and liberty, the golden triangle. Each is necessary for the other two parts. Every founder, and I mean every single one, from the most spiritual to the least, mentioned the necessity of the combination of these three ideas. They knew faith and virtue were necessary for liberty. This is just one of the things we have forgotten since our nation's founding, and it needs to be brought back. Now this isn't to say faith as in one religion. This is faith as in a religion. Any religion is better than no religion. This climb to start a college hasn't been easy. Quitting seems much easier often. We still need to find more great people with the same vision, students who want the kind of education Jefferson, Madison, and Washington, and even Lincoln had, and a community of like-minded people to help get this college going strong a school where virtues are taught, truths are learned, and our place in history is understood. Do I feel qualified to start a liberal arts college? No. That's why we keep waiting for someone else to do it. 
but I, I have a PhD, I've taught it to universities, but I have little experience in other areas. There are many people who are much more qualified than I am, but no one is stepping up. I once heard Sherry Dew, the president and CEO of Deseret Book, tell the story of how she got her job. When she was asked by Gordon B. Hinckley to be the president of Deseret Book, she said she felt completely unqualified and not up to the task. Soon she was back in his office to have a meeting with him. She told him she was not smart enough to be the president of Deseret Book. President Hinckley's response was, I know you're not smart enough. I'm sure that made her feel a lot better. <laughs> it would have definitely helped me, right? Then he said something that changed everything. He told her no one by themselves is smart enough to run Deseret Book or any other large company for that matter. But she was smart enough to gather people around her who do understand the different aspects of running the company. She caught the vision, gathered those people around her, and together they've turned Deseret Book around and now it's a really strong company. When I heard that, that was my answer. No, I'm not, a, I'm not smart enough to start a liberal arts college by myself but I am smart enough to gather the people around me who have the same vision of what a great education is and the, and the best way to acquire it. And together, we can be successful and help our students understand history, human nature, great truths, cause and effect of natural laws, and true principles. We can help our students gain a great leadership education with an amazing foundational knowledge as well as the practical leadership experience necessary to make their way in the world. Because remember, a great classical liberal arts education prepares students for the world, not just the workforce. All this explanation is to describe a little of what has happened since we first began imagining the idea of creating our own liberal arts college here. It was literally out of desperation we actually began the process. No one else would. So we felt like we had no choice. There are great students here in Utah who are homeschooled, private, or charter schooled, and are receiving that great education now and need a way to continue it through college. And since we have actively been working on it, we have seen amazing things happen. I believe there are times in all of our lives when we see something out of place or not right. We have the choice to either ignore it or to recognize it as a problem. If we recognize it as a problem, we have the choice to still ignore it or try to help. If we try to help, our choice soon becomes whether to give up when it gets tough or keep going until we reach the conclusion. Will the conclusion always work out? No. Will we always be successful in what we undertake? No, but that is no excuse to try. For most of us, the problem is how there are so many reasons to not do something and seemingly so few saying do it. Winston Churchill said, to each there comes in their lifetime a special moment when they are figuratively tapped on the shoulder and offered the chance to do a very special thing, unique to them and fitted to their talents. What a tragedy finds them unprepared or unqualified for that which could have been their finest hour. I agree with Churchill. That call will come to you as it has to me. Once that need is recognized, get to work. Get your own classical liberal arts education so you're prepared. Gain knowledge of things that never change. Do the research it takes. Do the hard work. Gather those around you who have expertise in the areas you don't and don't be afraid to answer that call. Find the meaning in your life. Waiting for someone else to step up might not happen. It just might have to be you.